Good morning. Welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I am Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. We're here on day 325, and we're beginning the book of 1 Timothy today. So that means over the next several months, interspersed with our Old Testament readings, where we're going to be shifting into the book um, of Judges. We're going to be looking at 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles. Uh, these are wonderful letters for anyone who is especially called to or interested in church leadership, um, but also for anyone who has a heart for a commitment to the church, which should be every Christian, really. If you're committed to Christ, you should be committed to his church. And so these are great letters for that. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help as we dig into 1 Timothy 1 today. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for calling us to belong to you and to belong to your church. We do pray, Father, that you would Help us today as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. Write your word on our hearts. <clears throat> and Father, help us to glorify you by what you teach us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I do apologize if my voice sounds a little bit off or <clears throat> if I'm clearing my throat a lot. I'm definitely fighting something. Some sort of cold bug thingy is coming into my head. So um, I have tea in my mug instead of coffee today to just try to help me. Uh, feel a little better. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love, that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank God who has given me strength. Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to. To blaspheme. That is 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, a great opening chapter to just a great 
not only a great letter, but a great set of letters here in First and Second Timothy and Titus. Just a, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, partly because I'm called to be a pastor, an elder, a shepherd, a teacher. And so these are very much feel written directly to me. Um, and, and that may not be you. That may not be uh, the role God has given you within his body. But know that the things that Paul is passionate about for the church of Jesus Christ are the things that every believer should be passionate about for the church of Jesus Christ. And we should be praying for and seeking these things within Christ's body, within God's church. So Paul is writing this, the Apostle Paul. He, You know who Paul is. He's the author of 13 New Testament books. Uh, half the books of the New Testament are authored by Paul. Letters to Rome, a couple of letters to Corinth, all of those. And these, First and Second Timothy, are written to a young protege in the ministry, Timothy, his true child in the faith, as he identifies him in verse 2, one that he has discipled, one that he has mentored, and one that he has prepared for ministry. And Timothy is serving as the pastor of the church in Ephesus, an elder, a teaching elder, the pastor, whatever one of those titles you want to use. He's at Ephesus. Ephesus was a very, very blessed church. They had the Apostle Paul, who planted the church and served there for two years. They had Timothy, who served there. They had the Apostle John, who served there. Amazing, remarkable start to this church. And yet, even by the end of the first century, Jesus, in the book of Revelation, is urging the church at Ephesus not to abandon their first love, not to, to be slack, not to be um, unzealous in their love for Christ. So you can have faithful pastoral teaching, you can have godly leadership, and a church still go astray uh, by worldly influence and by things of the flesh. And some of these things are here already. You have certain persons, right, in verse 6, who are desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. They're coming in and they're teaching things about the law that are inappropriate. We'll get to that in a minute. And then toward the end of chapter 1, he makes mention of Hymenaeus and Alexander, people who have made shipwreck of their faith. The church has always had to deal with false teachers. And it really is the calling of every Christian to be knowledgeable in the scriptures, to be discerning, to support and encourage faithful teachers, and to warn against unfaithful teachers. Now, in our day and age, I think we can take it a little bit too far in the other direction. We have people who enjoy being being the Berean, they'll, they'll call it, uh, sort of calling out everybody and, and their brother for being a false teacher because they've said one or two things of minor importance that they don't agree with. Uh, and, and I think that's unhelpful. But and you can almost lose the distinction between, you know, here's someone I don't fully agree with everything, or I wish they were stronger on this, or they seem to be a little bit you know, weak on this one particular point of doctrine, and then someone who's, who's just flat out misleading people, who's teaching people horrible things that should not be taught and are leading people astray. And, and so sometimes you get overly picky, you start straining at gnats, you end up swallowing camels, right? Jesus had to deal with that with the religious leaders in his day. So what is faithful ministry? What does it look like? That's part of what First and Second Timothy and Titus help us to do. Um, and it, so it is about sound doctrine. It's about not teaching any other doctrine. What are these other doctrines? Well, they're doctrines that are, have to do with myths and genealogies and speculations. And then so what is faithful doctrine? The stewardship from God that is by faith. Taking the gospel as a stewardship, the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, the one who has conquered sin and death. And as stewards of the gospel, the aim of our charge, the aim of our ministry, the aim of faithful gospel ministry is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Paul again and again in his letters points to these two distinguishing marks of those who are true believers. They have a genuine love for God and his people, and they have a sincere faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not in anyone or anything else. So faith and love are two key markers, and those are the things that a faithful minister will be wanting to see, will be aiming 
to see develop in the lives of those to whom he is proclaiming God's word. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience. How do we get a pure heart and a good conscience? Only if we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, only if we're covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, only if we are filled with the Holy Spirit do we ever have a pure heart and a good conscience. It's by grace through faith in Christ. And that will issue forth in love, love for God and love for others. And it will be demonstrable in the sincere faith that we have in Jesus. Contrary to that are myths. People who want to chase down all sorts of myths. I think of the Da Vinci Code and those books from Dan Brown and the movies that Tom Hanks made that were sort of chasing down this mythical idea that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and they had children. This is actually a, a sort of a late medieval myth that came out of France. Um, and, it's, and it's just a totally unhelpful. Conspiracy theories. When I think of myths, right, I think of conspiracy theories about the Illuminati or about, you know, some secret cabal that's really running the world and what they're really up to and don't you know who they are. That is not helpful. That is not helpful. And so people who push that kind of an agenda, um, like Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, for example, who wrote The Harbinger and whose latest book um, about the sons of God and you know, again, this myths about what life was like before the flood and how these giants were exterminating the human race and how that's going to come again through genetic therapies that are being pursued by Bill Gates and blah, 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 blah. Just no, just no, 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 no. That is mythology. That is conspiracy theorism. That is unhelpful and unsound doctrine, right? And so is an abuse of the law. Those who want to be teachers of the law without understanding what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, Paul understands the law quite well. He had been a Pharisee. He had studied under the most prominent rabbi in Judaism, Gamaliel. Uh, he, had, he had studied the law, and he saw how the law was fulfilled in Christ. And in other letters, he makes it clear that the law of Moses is so fulfilled in Christ that in Christ we no longer keep dietary laws or holy days or feasts or festivals as ways of being God's holy people. We are God's holy people through Christ. The law, the primary purpose of the law, which is what Paul is talking about here, is to confront people in their sin and charge them with guilt before God so that they will repent and seek forgiveness through Jesus Christ. That is what the law's primary purpose is. It is not primarily a pattern of living for Christian people, especially in its ceremonial aspects of dietary laws and feast days and other things like that. The, it shows us a picture of Christ. Christ fulfills it. Christ is our righteousness. If you're trying to get righteous by keeping the law, you're, you're going down a dead-end road because you can't be righteous by the law. You can only be righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. And you can't have uh, the pathway of the law as a way of salvation. It's not a way of salvation. It's a way that should lead you to Christ for salvation. And then this wonderful section uh, in verses 12 to 17, <clears throat> the heart of this, one of Paul's most famous sayings in verse 15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul is, Paul is just glorifying God with gratitude. Yesterday in our sermon on Isaiah 6, we saw how the pattern in the Bible moves us from God to guilt to grace to gratitude. Being confronted by the one true God shows us our guilt. And Paul says here, that's the purpose of the law in verses 8 through 11. The law is to confront people in their guilt before a holy God. But once we have been confronted in our guilt and have confessed our guilt, we receive grace. Verse 14, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me 
with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So that confronted by God, seeing our guilt, confessing our guilt, we receive grace and then gratitude. And here's Paul saying, I am the foremost of sinners, but I received mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example of those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And then he gives praise to God, to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see this overflowing heart of gratitude from Paul to say, I was saved so that I could be a display of how deep God's grace could go, how far God's grace will reach. It will reach even to a sinner like me. It's overflowing with gratitude. So from God to guilt to grace to gratitude, it's a great pattern for seeing all of scripture and life, really. And then finally, this charge that he gives to Timothy. He wants him to wage the good warfare. Being involved in Christian ministry and the Christian life is a life of warfare. It's a life of fighting against false teachers and the world and our flesh and the manipulations of Satan. And so <clears throat> Paul wants Timothy to fight the good fight, to fight the good warfare. How? By holding on to faith and a good conscience. Faith in Jesus Christ, because he's the captain of our salvation. He is the king of the ages. He is the one who has given us strength who has appointed us to his service. He is the one through whom we have received mercy and grace. He is the one in whom we place our faith. So it is faith in Jesus Christ and a good conscience. And that means that we act in accord with the example of Christ, the law of love, the, the pattern of loving God and loving neighbor, with a good conscience. Does that mean we never sin? Of course not. We sin all the time, but we confess our sin. We're forgiven of our sin and our conscience is clean. We're not, we're not harboring pet sins in the closet, not wanting people to see them. We're not, we're not treasuring up evil within our hearts. We are sincerely seeking to follow and honor the Lord as a display of his grace to a world that needs to see him and know him. So holding faith in a good conscience. And some people reject that. Some people reject needing faith in Jesus Christ. They think they can do it by the law. Some people reject having a good conscience. They're, they're manipulative and self-serving, and they make a shipwreck of their faith. And this has always been the case within the Christian church. Within the church of Jesus Christ, there's always been false teachers who shipwreck their own faith and unfortunately shipwreck the faith of others who follow them blindly. And so a, a sincere part of being a faithful pastor is to be on the guard against such men. Well, we're going to continue in this book. Every few days, we'll be coming back to 1 Timothy. Uh, it's a wonderful book, and uh, I'm glad you are able to join me for this first chapter. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace that has saved us. Thank you for your love that has drawn us to Christ. Thank you for the, the hope of salvation, the the peace with you that we have only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We praise you, Father. Help us to live holding on to faith and a good conscience. Help us to follow the pattern of sound doctrine that we see in Paul and in Timothy and in John and in Peter. Help us to follow after these godly men who laid down an example for us to love you, to love others, to believe in Christ, to hold to faith and a good conscience and to sincerely seek to glorify you in gratitude for your grace to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's 1 Timothy 1. Tomorrow we are going to jump back to <clears throat> Joshua. Hope you can join us for that. Joshua 22 is on tap for tomorrow morning. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Mm -hmm.